Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality-expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre, with your host, Lonnie Scott. And we are recording. Jack Grail, welcome to Weird Web Radio. It is awesome to have you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here, Lonnie. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. I mean, we've only been chatting for a while now. We should have recorded all that too, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> now, in the off chance some of you folks don't know who Jack is by now, uh, Jack is the author of The Hecatean. Is that how you say that? I'm not sure how to pronounce the title of the book. I say Hecatean, but then, you know, it's, it's up to, yeah. it's one of those things that since it's a made up word, it's, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's sort of uh, equally, everyone's equally right. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Jack teaches an amazing course over at the Blackthorn, Blackthorn School um, called Hail. I say Hecate, he says Hecate. And so <laughs> let's call the whole thing off, right? From from his perspective, it is Hail Hecate walking a fork path, and uh, I believe teaches another course on the PGM as well through the same school. Yeah, right. Called um, a PGM Praxis: Fifty Rights for Fifty Nights. Yeah, but who's got time for all that nonsense now? Yeah, right? No kidding. <laughs> 50 of anything. Too much. 50 of anything. I don't know. You can't see me. I'd take 50 burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a good noble try anyway. <laughs> all right. So um, I think before we dig into anything too personal about you, I'm going to pretend that we have listeners who perhaps don't know what we're talking about when we say Hecate or Hecate. Who is or what is the force behind the name? Sure. Well, the the class I teach is, I'm, is, is called Hail Hecate, Walking the Fork Path. I'm a devotee of Hecate. Hecate is a name that, the, that came out of Hellenic culture for the goddess, the Titan, who was said to embody the spirit of the crossroads of the threshold, right? So there was, they envisioned a spirit that whose jurisdiction was the border between life and death, between here and there, between then and now, between the inner worlds and the outer worlds, between what has been and what will be. And this border spirit, the, the Romans recognized her, but they also had a spirit called Janus, you know, and, uh, but the, uh, the Greeks, had a spirit called Hecate, and she was honored and known throughout the Hellenic and Roman civilizations and, and throughout the areas that they touched. And, uh, you know, she continues on through the literature of the, the age after that. But basically, some people know her as the witch queen. Some people know her as the, the guard and guide of Persephone in the Eleusian Mysteries. Other people know her as the, uh, the daughter of night or the daughter of destruction and the starry sky. But she's this feminine titan who's typically portrayed as flanked by dogs and holding torches or keys or whips or daggers. She's the one who escorts the dead souls, like Hermes Cothonios, uh, escorts the dead souls of mortals to the underworld or occasionally raises dead souls to the upper world. She's basically the mediatrix and the intermediary between different worlds, different states, different places. And because of that, she's, um, you know, a lot of people are drawn to her who are drawn to liminal states. Mm. How do you think Hecate becomes associated in the beginning with these liminal spaces, the spaces in between, the crossroads? Is it something indicated in the translation of her names or epithets, or is it something locked inside of a myth? No, I don't think so. I mean, her name is just a nickname, Hecate. It simply means far worker. And she wasn't the only one to have it. You know, Apollo was called Hecatos, meaning he could shoot people from afar with his arrows. Every time <laughs> a person died, a man died, they said, uh, you know, that uh, Apollo shot him down, the far worker Apollo. And the same thing for uh, his sister, uh, that every time, you know, Diana or Artemis uh, shot someone that they, a woman, you know, her life was taken and her soul uh, went to the underworld. So the, the name doesn't have much to do with anything. 
But in the Illusion Mysteries, which were an initiation tradition, in um, a mystery tradition in Athens, every year, all the Athenians would walk 10 miles of fasting and dancing and chanting to Eleusis. And they would go through, they would reenact the goddess Demeter's search for her lost daughter, Persephone. And they would be escorted by the torchbearers. And the torchbearers were you know, performers um, who were dressed like Dionysus and Hecate. And these torchbearers would escort the Athenians to Eleusis. And the, while singing the songs and reenacting this drama, the Athenians would learn the myth of Demeter and Persephone and celebrate it. And in that myth, Hecate served as a guard and a guide who assisted Demeter in her search and then also comforted and uh, accompanied Persephone when she was discovered to be married to the, uh, you know, Hades, the king of the underworld, and uh, to escort her on her journey to the upper world for part of the year, back down to the underworld for the winter months. So I think that this idea of her as a being who could traverse from the upper world to the underworld and back again, escorting Persephone to the land of the dead and from the land of the dead, gave her street cred, so to speak, as a psychopomp, <laughs> as a soul guide. So when mortals thought about, well, who will guide my soul to the underworld when I die? They thought of her or Hermes. And when they thought, a sorcerer thought, I, if I wanted to raise the dead, who would I call? Well, they thought of her. So she became associated with necromantic magic and, and sorcery and witchcraft. Because in the ancient world, just as in Thai folk magic today, much of the, the engine of magic was driven by the fuel of the restless dead. It was restless spirits who had died violently or young um, or unexpectedly or without children, or unburied, without being initiated. It was them that was thought to roam restlessly, just like we think of ghosts now. We think, you know, if a place, if someone died on a lonely night, a teenager on the road that had their whole life ahead of them, even now, people that aren't even spiritual or religious will shiver when they pass that spot or they'll whisper mm -hmm. that, that their, their ghost is being seen roaming because it makes sense to us. It's someone who, whose life was cut short would feel cheated and they wouldn't go peacefully to their afterlife or, or whatever it was, but would sort of haunt the area where they died. And that idea is, is universal. It's, it's not ancient. It's not just contemporary. It's not just American. It's not just Western. It occurs throughout all human cultures. And the Greeks and, and Romans uh, had it too. And so they believed that if you were going to do a magical working, whether it was divination or making someone love you with a fever of desire or making an enemy sick, that you needed someone to do it. The magician couldn't really do it because you're immortal too, but a spirit could. And what spirit would be most likely to help you? But one that was disappointed, one that was frustrated, one that was still roaming, one that wasn't resting peacefully, one that was looking for some sort of interaction, some sort of purpose, some way to continue their story, to further their tale, you know. And it was thought and is thought that if you could reach out to these spirits, offer them something of value, compel them, by that which they hold dear, that you could create a supernatural effect because of this supernatural alliance. There's a lot to unpack in an answer like <laughs> that, my friend. <laughs> I can just hear the pen scribbling now. <laughs> right. Right. Um, right. I, I like how you bring up in that that very long answer. It beautifully done. <laughs> oh no, that's that was fantastic. Um, the the idea that there are places where people's lives have suddenly ended unexpectedly right. and in how universally almost we seem to consider these things yeah. like a, a crime against nature, almost like yeah. an atrocity against the very act of, of existing. Is there something that you would do as a sorcerer or devotee of Hecate in a place like that, that could perhaps assuming there is a spirit still locked in that place or wandering or lost to help them. That's interesting. Here's the unusual thing that if you look at the, the Greco Egyptian magical papyri, which are, you know, a, a set of several hundred spells that were dug up from a tomb in Thebes in ancient Egypt. And they have the actual, the actual conjurations used to raise restless dead spirits. Right. And the method 
that they do it is is very simple. But what's interesting is, you know, first of all, the sorcerer isn't trying to help spirits rest. He's trying to agitate them all the more. <laughs> He's having the opposite effect. I think of something called like, I think of it, it could be split into two things. I think of it as shamanic necromancy and sorceress necromancy. I think of shamanic as someone who serves the community. Someone like that might hear that there's a haunting and typically might avail himself, call upon the spirit, try to intuit what the spirit needs to rest easy so that the community isn't haunted anymore or so that this you know, dead community member can rest easy and give it to them, whether it's recognition of who they were, gifts, songs, a memorial, something like that, right? But a sorceress necromancy is the opposite. You call upon the spirit, you agitate it by reminding it of the details of how it was cheated. You remind it of how its life was cut short. You remind it that it should have had much better than it did. You remind it of all the people that have more than it. You remind it that everyone's forgot it except you. And then when it's at a vulnerable place, you say, but you work with me and your story is not over. Your tale is not told. Your song is not sung. I have work for you. You're not done yet. I have something to give you. No one else gives you anything. I'll give you a drink. I'll give you food. I'll say your name. I'll remember you to people. I'll recognize who you are. But you need to help me if I do this for you. And here's what I want. Right. So it's the opposite. It's stirring it up. Now, what's interesting in Thai magic, this sort of necromancy is actually considered to be beneficial to the spirit in the long run because they believe in reincarnation and they believe in karma. So they believe if a spirit was it did die young, if its, its life was cut short, it must have bad karma from a past life. Right. Mm -hmm. So then they believe if a magician or a sorcerer, a Thai folk sorcerer were to give it um, a job to do. And if the spirit were to do it, then not only would the spirit accrue good credit, good karma for its next life, but that the sorcerer as a gift to the spirit, they wouldn't maybe just give him a glass of, of beer or a cigarette or a few coins, but they would do good deeds in their name, such as donating money to a you know to to the poor such as gifting something to a monk such as praying on their behalf would do things that would add to that dead spirit's credit and mitigate their karma in the coming life so thai magic it works on the same principles as the magic of the pgm the necromancy found in ancient egypt but it's actually more developed and it's actually consistent with their world, their spiritual worldview of reincarnation. Because even if you're a sorcerer calling upon a spirit to make someone be inflamed with love or fall sick or, or to do divination, you can contribute to that spirit having a better life in the next round of reincarnation by your prayers and your good deeds. So it's really cool. That is a very interesting like relationship between two different cultures yeah. over time you yeah. know? and the yeah. approaches aren't dissimilar exactly it's it's i think the ideology that's behind the action that marks the difference oh, oh that's well, where the curiosity right. is yeah. yeah no you're you're quite right and it, what it speaks to which i find exciting is that there's a the fact that there's a similar paradigm <clears> for <throat> spirit work in two cultures that are 4,000 miles apart and 2,000 years apart yeah. tells me that this isn't just people making up stuff. There's a universal principle of how to deal with spirits because many of the spells either in contemporary Thai folk magic or ancient Egyptian sorcery work on the same principles. You go to the place where they were killed or buried. You call aloud to the spirit to trigger their you know, their, their, um, their acknowledgement. You leave an offering, bread or a libation, some sort of drink. You call upon, a, this is most important, you call upon a mediating spirit. It's assumed you can't do the work yourself. You need, you set a thief to catch a thief. You set a spirit to catch a spirit. So you call upon Hecate or Hermes Cathonios or Anubis or Osiris or Persephone, someone who has jurisdiction over the dead or over the gateway between the living and the dead. And you say to them, retrieve this soul or release this soul or allow this soul to speak to me or bring them forth. And then the spirit, you use magical compulsive words, epithets, magical voices, things like that to show that, that you actually have knowledge of, of how the, 
the mysterium works. And then when the spirit's brought forth, you enter into, you know, an exchange with them. You say, look, here's what I need. I'll give you this if you give me that. And uh, to do this, you often will want to put something like the dirt from their grave or a piece of their bodily materia near the target. All these things I just mentioned are present in both Thai folk magic and the sort and the necromancy of the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. So there's very clear parallels in the protocols between the two, which shows me that there's sort of a universal rule about spirit contact, and both of them are referencing the same paradigm. Yeah, it's very... It's it's like when you hear people say... I, I hear this in heathenry a lot, you know, like it's it's an orthopraxic religion. It's about the practice, what you do. Yeah. It's not about what you believe. Correct. So there you have it in spirit work. You know, it's about what you do, not right. necessarily what you believe. And you, one of the most effective things I found intervening in a haunting without putting any of that together that you've just said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is for instance, uh, say I've got a friend needs help. I go to a place and I determine that there is some sort of activity. I'll make it known. This is what I'm willing to give you the spirit in return for you to do the following things. Shut the fuck up. Not bother these people. Stay away <laughs> from their kids. Stop fucking with the toys. And Oh, by the way, you're allowed to go batshit crazy when they're not here. And there's an intruder. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and in return, they agree to give you the following things on the following schedule and so on. I have found that to be the most effective intervention in a haunting. You, that's fascinating. I didn't know you did that. That's a, that's an absolutely traditional approach to offer this for that. It's a reciprocal arrangement, you know, and um, just in the past year, there was a, there was a dis discovery of a, a wonderful, um, an, an image on a slab, the earliest depiction of a ghost which shows it in a you know, ancient Near Eastern culture being led somewhere to where it can be gifted with something. So it'll stop haunting, as the spell says. <laughs> it's going to be right. So it's not just cast out or banished like you would think in a typical Christian you know, working. It's actually being redirected, we would call it, given something of value. So it will stop acting out. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's exactly what you're talking about, despite the, you know, thousands of years apart. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> idea. I apparently somewhere along the way in all of this, I stepped into a resonant energy. I think <laughs> <laughs> after hearing the way you tied those together, I thought, yeah, that is, I've not made that, that, that tie. I don't know a whole lot. Speaking of tie, a whole lot about tie magic. So, um, have you yourself experienced a haunting? Have you ever like encountered something where you thought that's definitely spirit activity? You know, the only ghost I feel like I've ever seen was a ghost of a mouse. Well, <laughs> it counts. <laughs> it's, it's, it seems silly, but it's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have, yeah. I, I love mice. I've always liked mice. And, um, and in the, you know, the, the fall and winter, we tend to get them. And if I can, I set live trap to live traps, you know, to get them out of the yeah, house. We do the same. Yeah. And, um, Actually, I think this was like early, early spring. And um, and I caught one and uh, I showed him to my daughter in the live catch. And he was a beautiful mouse. He had these bright oil, his eyes were like oil drops, you know, and, and he's a beautiful little fellow. And um, and I said, well, let's get him out. Of, he needed to eat dinner. And I said, we'll drop him off at the park because it was the temperature had come up to the, the, you know, 40s. And I thought that was warm enough to release him. And uh, but he was scrabbling around a lot. And I was worried that he would. You know, he would, he would, he would uh, hurt himself. So we put him in a bucket, but he jumped. And my daughter, who was holding a glass of water, shrieked and jumped back. And I covered it and I put it outside. And then I, uh, you know, we had dinner and then I drove, we drove to the park and I said, go release the mouse in this hedge. And she did. And, uh, and then we drove away. And as we got home, I said, so did it, you know, scuttle away. And she said, well, no, it mostly just sat there. And I said, I wonder why. And she said, well, he was wet. And I said, why was he wet? She said, well, when, when he jumped, I spilled my drink in there. And I thought, well, how? I wouldn't have released him if I thought it was soaking wet on it. It's evening. It's in the low 40s and getting cool. Right. 
but I had to be somewhere. And so I did my thing. But the whole time I was at the thing I had to be at, I kept thinking of this mouse soaking wet that I'd released. And uh, it seems silly, but I felt bad for him. And then after I was done, I drove back to the park and I went to look. And when I went to the hedge, he was where my daughter had left him and he had died of the cold. And he was still supple. He'd just died. And I had this terrible feeling come over me. And I felt like I, through my own stupidity, had killed this creature that was beautiful and that didn't need to die. And I, I felt really sick about it, actually. And I, um, and I went to sleep that night. And I had this dream. And in the dream, I was walking along. Because I, I, um, I actually, uh, in the dream, I was walking along. And um, I approached a tree and I noticed that there was a creature in the tree and I looked up and the creature was, a, it was like a person, but the person was nude and their flesh was white and their head was like a horse skull and they had long red hair. And I stared at the creature and I knew intuitively it was the mouse. And he looked at me and I looked at him and, um, and we had a sort of conversation without words. And uh, he told me his name. And I came to understand this was the creature I'd killed to my stupidity. And um, and we said a few things to each other, but it wasn't like a logical conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I woke up and I felt this strange, you know, this strange feeling that it had been an actual spirit presence and not just um, and not just a dream. Because it, if I were going to dream about a ghost of a mouse, it wouldn't have looked like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And. It's interesting because obviously a dream isn't the same thing as a waking vision, but in the ancient world, that's usually the way ghosts appeared to people was in dreams. In Homer's uh, in Homer's Iliad, when um, when uh, Patroclus dies, his best friend Achilles has a vision of him, but the vision occurs in a dream. The his, the ghost of his dead friend appears to him when he's sleeping, and they have a conversation with each other, and that was one of the ways that they recognized that people who weren't you know, mystics are really gifted at seeing spirits could encounter the dead was through a uh, dream and, uh, you know, through sleep. So, and that stayed with me ever since. And the mouse told me his name and, uh, and I've never forgotten it. And I've never really known quite what to do with it either. Mm -hmm. I always felt that if I tried to build on that, there might've been a relationship there as much as you can form a relationship with a non-human spirit. And so, um, it stuck with me, and I know it's not a typical ghost story, but it's the only one. I've no, heard. it's a beautiful <laughs> ghost story. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I know if my fiance, who's a vegan, listens to the story, you're, she's instantly going to like you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, um, it, it as you mentioned, you know, it's not unheard of for any kind of spirit contact human or otherwise to occur in dreams yeah one of the one of the most profound dream experiences i've ever had in my life uh was several years ago when i was in college and my great great or my great grandmother she was 96 and she really did kind of position herself as, as matriarchal energy among our family yeah. you know on my mom's side and Anyway, uh, I was in college at the time. I go to bed that night. I've got class in the morning, do our usual thing. And I wake up in the middle of the night and I shake my girlfriend at the time awake. I said, did you hear that? She goes, what? And I said, I heard like the scream of a train, like a, like a train was making this horrid whistle right by the house and the whole house shook. And she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't hear anything. Wow. It's like, okay, fine. I go back to sleep. I go back to sleep and... I enter into a dream at some point where I'm sitting there with my great grandmother and she's basically taking me to task. She's like, this is what I love about you. This is what I wish you would do differently. This is how you huh. piss me off. <laughs> you oh my God. Really? <laughs> and then by the end of it, she just gives me this big hug and she goes in. I just want you to know that I'm okay now. Oh, wow. No and kidding. off I go. I wake up the next morning. Uh, I'm 45 years old. When I was in college, there were no cell phones like there are today. I go on about my day doing my thing until finally um, I go back home and I get a phone call on, my, on the phone phone, the landline from my mom telling me, uh, I just wanted to let you know that your grandma, I'm talking about great grandma, 
passed away in the in the night last no night in the nursing way. home. Yeah. So that that is one of those dreams that has always stuck with me. It was so of course. Like, emotional and real and I couldn't shake the fact I'm like I think she actually stopped by somehow. It's one of those things that kept me going along my magical studies, you know, yeah. studying these things like why, 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 how do I find out more? How do I solve that puzzle? Yeah. Yeah, so no, dreams are pretty common way and reported among all cultures, I believe, involving yeah. some kind of spirit contact. That makes sense. You That's know. amazing. What an incredible story. Why is it that you came to Hecate to begin with? How did you get interested and curious about her? Well, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it can be kind of, um, there's a temptation to sort of backwards engineer the reason afterwards, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> there's a, it used to be thought that, um, it used to be thought reasonably that when you had ancient rituals and cults, that the rituals and cults had been created to match the myth. But then there came an interesting theory that actually cult came first and myth came second. The people invented stories to sort of justify what they were already doing intuitively, seasonally, you know, these festivals and these celebrations and these certain, you know, harm diverting actions and stuff. And sometimes I think we do the same thing. We point out why this God or why that spirituality or whatever. We just mm -hmm. start to do things physically. And then we find the justification in looking at, you know, this, I chose this goddess, or I read this book, or I made this choice. But, <laughs> but in reality, it's trying to justify what we were already going to do to begin with, you know. <laughs> uh, so I'm tempted, you know, I've talked to a, you know, a few other people on, you know, a record about it, choosing Hecate or picking Hecate. But the fact is, I think, I think we're naturally drawn to certain powers and certain paradigms and certain forms of spirituality. And even if we come up with reasons, it's an intuitive process, you know, it's instinct. Mm -hmm. Some people are drawn, you know, to more masculine patriarchal paternal deities. And some people are drawn to more feminine and, you know, and more, uh, some people are drawn to more celestial intellectual, um, forms of spirituality, theurgic and others to more, um, thonic and more, you know, the things that are more intuitive and of the earth and embodied and sensual. And other people look for, you sort of formal cults that reference their their bloodlines or their nationalities or the what they imagine their you know their relatives to have done a thousand years ago. <laughs> and other people want to break with tradition. They want to do something totally new that no one's in their family's ever done before. You know, they want to they want to be the first of their their kind to to do something totally different. And so you know, we all bounce around like pinballs and, and land into one of those slots, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, esoteric or mainstream or, or whatever. And for whatever reason, Hakate filled that gap for me. There was something about a feminine, titanic, phonic spirit who occupied the borderlands, you know, the liminal space, the threshold, those, you know, in-between spaces where anything can happen. And I think so much of the mundane world seems sort of... um or at least it did at the time, seemed plotted out, seemed already, you know, like everything's already figured out. I've always been drawn to liminal places, you know, hidden things and and secret worlds and, uh, you know, through fiction or literature or, or ancient myth or, or pop culture. So a goddess who literally embodied liminality had a really strong pull because that's sort of where the action is, you know, between here and there, between this yeah. and that you know, between now and then, between good and bad, between healthy and sick, between dead and alive, between real and, and unreal, there's this gray area. And in that gray area, anything can happen. And that's a real fertile place to be. And so I was drawn mm -hmm. to that. And she seemed closest to it. So I became drawn to her. I completely understand where you're coming from with that. I, I think it's, it's it's again referring to a word resonance it's resonating with particular things in the world yeah. you know i i um my own contact with hecate was was unsought 
I, I didn't ask for it. I would. I didn't even know who she was. I joined Jason Miller's Strategic Sorcery Club oh, sure, years sure. and years ago. I mean, it's been a very long time ago now. And if anybody is like a a, a main spirit involved in his practice, it's definitely Hecate and. Um, he puts out a thing for all the people who are in the strategic sorcery course. It's separate from his sorcery of Hecate stuff. It's kind of the first thing he ever did. Um, they're global rights where everyone who's a sorcerer practicing his particular methods, we all have a specific ritual that we do globally together uh, as scheduled. And around Halloween, it's always to Hecate. And a couple cycles of doing this, I start to have these just weird thoughts, like, who is this spirit anyway? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and off I go digging and find out a little bit more and experiment with this and read that. I got a uh, Sorita D'Este's book. Sure. It, it, it books that she had out that time. I learned a little bit more. And a friend of mine, Kim Huggins, she is a professional tarot reader. She's well known in the tarot world, has oh, published cool. a couple of decks and books. I'm getting a tarot reader reading from her one day. And she keeps making mention that Hecate is coming up. I mean, in, in the particular deck she's using, it's called the Tarot Apocalypse by her and Eric Dunn. Hecate is a card in the, in the deck. Oh, wow. And, Very yeah. Cool. And she says, um, she goes, I, she kept going. I feel like uh, Hecate wants to have a conversation with you of some kind. And I made a joke. I feel like I'm getting friend zoned by Hecate. <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> Much like you, I'm attracted to liminal spaces, the strange things, the magic of the situation. I, I, If you ask me all the different God-sized spirits that I like to work with, they're all associated with magic and the dead and the underworld and cemeteries and, yeah. and yeah. spirits and so on. So that's kind of my gig, too. And I, like you, I don't, it's, I don't think it's something I set out for. It's just right. kind of, I, I think I slipped into a stream that I kind of belong in. That's a good way to put it, to slip into a stream, you know? Yeah. It, it is sort of like, you feel like a leaf on the wind or a twig in a stream where you're picked up by different eddies and some dead end and some are stagnant and some kind of go backwards. But then you find something where you feel comfortable and all of a sudden there's a lot of movement at once and there's a lot of mm -hmm. progress at once and you can't get out of it. There's a feeling of a little bit of being helpless with it too, because sometimes <laughs> you feel like fate is conspiring to push you in a certain direction where even if you pass it up or, or don't do it, it crops up again. It crops like the card and the reading, you know, or you start seeing things in pop culture, hearing songs that reference it, or you start suddenly people bring it up to you. And it's kind of like the algorithm. You have one conversation with a friend and then, you know, Facebook's trying to sell you the same thing you were talking about over and right. over again. But it feels like in some ways, spirituality is like that too. Once you start to have an idea of the direction you feel you need to go, all of a sudden it, it starts cropping up everywhere. And you think, well, I can keep ignoring this, or maybe I should go with the flow and give it a shot and see where it leads, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he Hecate is really enjoying a sort of renaissance, I think. Um, the more I learned about her and the more I, my practice involved, you know, her in devotional and sorcery and so on, I can I couldn't help but notice more of the groups and the different people who are teaching their particular approach to Hecate yeah. and, and and the different schools of thought that are centering around her. And I, I would say amongst all the the spirits who are active in human imagination and spirituality right now, she's definitely one of the leading up and comers for quite a while now. Um, why do you have a theory on why that may be? Why why she's that attractive to modern witches, pagans, sorcerers, and occultists of all kinds? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think that a quick answer could be we live in liminal times right now. So maybe a, a titan, a goddess who embodies liminality just seems appropriate to our age, you know? There's something she's meant to, to occupy that space between this and between that. And a lot of people... <laughs> myself included, think we're clearly in a transitional phase as a culture. We seem to be going from something we know to something we can't guess at. And that puts us in a liminal space. So a, a goddess of liminality maybe sounds appropriate as a guard and guide to help us through that transition, especially if it, if it feels as it often does uncertain, dangerous, you know, 
and uh, and foreboding. It's it's a comfort to have that power there, and also I think when you a lot of things feel like they're unraveling, especially the sense of a a common culture and a common spiritual background and common spiritual goals and common spiritual um, you know uh, beliefs, and so when that happens, I think a lot of people it it uh, seek to find personal empowerment through magic and sorcery, as opposed to relying on a hierarchy of initiated people to do it for them. And so there's Mm -hmm. a certain sort of person that says, I want to do it myself. I don't trust these people. These people seem corrupt or dangerous or unconcerned with people like me. So I'm going to, I'm going to find some form of spirituality where I can feel protected and in touch and in tune and, and connected to a spiritual power and not have to, have it, my experience mediated through people I don't respect or who don't respect me. I want to have a direct experience of the divine. And a lot of people that are disenfranchised with their, their families or their parish or their, you know, the, their culture or the, you know, what they perceive as the patriarchal and corporate um, cultures think I want to revert to an earlier age when that, when I, I didn't, you know, when there were powers that weren't so monotheistic, when there was uh, spirituality, that wasn't so managed and curated by a power structure, which I have no respect for and no place in. And I, you know, mm-hmm. I wouldn't let, I wouldn't have lunch with these people. Why am I going to let them tell me whether or not I'm going to heaven or not, or, or, or how I can heal myself or, or whether I can speak to the divine and too much of the mundane world seems sort of desacralized and, uh, and just that mundane. And, and there's a, I think there's a, a great hunger to resacralize and rewild our existence and that's why people are hungry for stories about spirits and ghosts. And that's why people want to visit haunted places or, or, or liminal places or, or think about finding creatures that everyone thought died out long ago or, mm-hmm. or discovering uh, that, that magic works or there's a way to talk to ghosts so that you could actually leave your body or divine things. It, it upends the known paradigm. But the known mm-hmm. paradigm for a lot of people is just sort of distressingly mundane or the or the magic of it seems out of touch unless you're a physicist or you know independently wealthy or something. So they're looking for more personal ways to connect with that which is uh, uncertain and um, exciting and and uh, you know sort of fluid and uh, phenomenal. And so magic or the goddess of magic seems like an obvious choice for those who feel that way. What steps would you take, or would you even recommend someone take? if they feel in that they're in that position that everything's just too mundane, too desacralized, they want to rewild it. Like how, how can you, you be an active participant in something like that? You know, it's a good question. Like, where do you start? Where do you mm-hmm. start? You know, if you live in a, if you live in a suburb and you got a nine to five job, that's not that thrilling. You have relationships <laughs> that seem, you know, they're okay, but they're not, you know, they're, they're so crazy. And, and, and there's this sense of how do I, it could be like this for the next 60 years. And there's that claustrophobic feeling that can creep in. I'm not that old, you know, and, and maybe I don't have unlimited funds to go travel the world or, you know, go to Stonehenge or, or you know, or, or, or all that. Like, so where do I, where do I start making my, my existence exciting and giving some wonder to it, some awe? Because not everyone wants to worship you know, it's easy to say, well, worship Hecate, that'll do it. But to be honest, like <laughs> not everyone feels drawn to that. Not everyone right. wants to, they're like, well, I'm not an ancient Greek. You know, I'm not an ancient Egyptian. I'm not, why, why can't I be myself here now? What can I discover that can help me connect as a person living where I live, doing what I do to something that's awesome and wondrous and stuff? And I think the answer is kind of twofold. The answer is no path that makes you pretend to be something you're not has any merit. You know, you can't mm. pretend to be an ancient Egyptian priest. They, they don't exist anymore. You know, you can't pretend to be like, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pretend to be a, you know, whatever. It, it's silly. You know, it's it's make believe. It's OK if you're going to a convention, you're LARPing or you're role playing, <laughs> but it's not a spiritual path to do to, to pretend, I think. But the answer is this. the If you look past the cultural trappings. It starts with the belief that there are unseen powers in the world and this idea that you can connect with them. And if you connect with them, you can touch something that's on an intuitive level that the powers that be can't curate. 
there's a there's sort of a wild current that runs through the world and different cultures have given it different names you know there's a threshold goddess of liminality in Greece but there's also a threshold god of liminality in voodoo and there's a threshold god of liminality in asian religion like in any aspect of life you pick whether it's whether it's um you know being a fatherhood and a leader or a domesticity and a healthy home of science and and medicine or of you know of, of sensuality and sexuality these these aspects of our lives people in every culture have believed you can connect with the raw substance of that human experience of warfare, of sensuality, of magic, of profit, of leadership and rule, of healthy homes, of disease, of order and structure and health. You can touch the raw essence of it and that there's aspects of it scattered around in people and things throughout the world. And that's exciting. You think, well, how could I contact the very spirit of warfare or the spirit of sensuality, or the spirit of magic, or the spirit of profit. And that's where these cultural approaches come in, you know? And so you, you take a look at it and you say, all right, well, there's different, we could pick a sort of a neo-pagan paradigm where you honor them devotionally, or we could pick sort of a, a ceremonial aspect. We call upon angels over these powers or we could approach them from a planetary aspect where we look at what the astrological or planetary correspondences are. Or we could look at them from sort of a, a contemporary standpoint, like hoodoo or something where it's all about the praxis, you know. Or there's initiated traditions, the African traditional uh, or Gnostic, uh, you know, churches that are out there that initiate people in these mysteries. Or there's having direct, you know, sort of direct experience, shamanic type experiences. We have trance work where you do vision stuff, where you actually engage in to find altered states, to find your version of these powers. Because what it amounts to, it's always individualized. You know, whether if, if, if I and someone else try to contact Zeus at the same time, your Zeus won't be my Zeus. It's that spirit of power, leadership, fatherness, you know, and that, that will come. But it means something different to you than me. The images in our head are different. You know, the, what we reach out to when we reach out to that image, your Odin is different from my Odin. It's personal. And that's the exciting thing is if you reach out to these powers, whether you call them planets or paradigms or archetypes or gods or ghosts or titans or spirits of the earth, elementals, whatever, if you reach out to them, they come and they come in a way that you can perceive based on your own experiences and your own needs and all that. I believe. Everything you call comes every time, but your ability to perceive it depends on how ready you are, your ability to experience it, or your ability just to recognize it, that it's there. Because again, you're calling on something without a body. And we're such visual people, you know, we're used to just saying, I called, nothing came. It's like, well, mm -hmm. you called, you didn't see anything, but you called something that doesn't have a body. So what were you expecting? You know, <laughs> how would, if you called, if you called upon the very essence of sensuality, an ecstasy, how would it appear if it came? You know, probably not a form, but if it was in your life, you called and it came, how would your life change? What would your reality be different like? And if you start opening your mind to that, you start to see all these epiphanies. You know, the Greeks had a word, you know, epiphany, which they often associated with the appearance of the God, but they had another word, a cratophany, which is an appearance of power, divine power. And a lot of times when you start making these calls to whatever system you, you have, you start experiencing these cratophanies, these epiphanies, and your own life becomes sacralized as you start to see cropping up, you know, signs of, of, these un, of the unseen world intermingling with your mundane reality. And suddenly the mundane becomes less mundane you know? mm -hmm. and it's exciting, but it, it requires a leap of faith. And it requires to be able to feel foolish and say, well, I'm going to try this hoodoo right. I know it's, it seems goofy, but I'm going to give it a shot. Or I'm going to pay money for this class. It might be a waste of money, but I'm going to give it a shot. You know, Or I bought this book for $20 at the bookstore. I can't believe the sigil thing works like it's supposed to, but I'm going to give it a shot. It, in a way, it makes you be a child again. You know, mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to go to this house and see if I see a ghost. Or I'm going to go to this crossroads and, and see if I meet a black dog or a black 
you know, uh, figure. And, and it makes you put yourself out there in a way that's very vulnerable. And yet it's the only way to make it happen, you know, is to take a <laughs> risk. Right. And right. so it, <laughs> it's exciting, but it's scary too. And it, you set yourself up for kind of a roller coaster experience and, uh, you know, and you set yourself up for other people to think you're being goofy, but it's, <laughs> you know, when do you, when do you get something unless you risk something, right? Oh, for sure. Uh, I used to ask people on the show, you know, what's something that you do that an outside observer would consider absurd or silly. And I thought I, I stopped asking it because I thought an outside observer could see me, you know, like throw a rock in the river and say, Hey, river spirits, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I've lost my damn mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, you're you're right. You just have to be willing to be you have to be willing to be silly. And yeah, it just comes down to that. It, it's going to feel weird at first. It's you're going to feel like you're doing something odd, wrong, or off. But you're you'll you'll probably be excited at the same time, and that's what you need to focus on and and chase yeah. that rabbit. There's a there's a childishness a childishness to it. You know, mm -hmm. if if you I mean I'm 50, but when I think back to when I was a little kid. And how scary, scary things seemed, you know, or so amazing, even just a, a, a book in a library that had incredible pictures or a fantasy story. I'd obsess about it all night long when you first discovered role playing games or when you knew Halloween was coming or when there was a, you, one of your friends said they saw they saw something, you know, a monster in the, the, in the backyard or whatever. Or when, you know, the rumor got out that, this, you know, this or that, like you would get so caught up in it and we lose that. You know, we lose that as things become mundane and we settle in and our worlds get smaller and smaller and more and more focused on our job, duty to our family and friends, you know, a bank yeah. account, keeping in touch, keeping, you know, w w with whatever organizations we're part of. Our world gets narrower and narrower. And so what this search does is you start to broaden it when you say, all right, I'll, I'm going to act like a fool. I'll act like a child. <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to try this, you know. I'll try this prayer. Or I'll try this bit of superstition or I'll stay up late and see if I can see the ghost. Or I'll go camping so we can go on a night hike or I'll, I'll go to the cemetery and I'll, I'll leave some coins on the soldier's grave or I'll actually, you know, on this day of the year, I'll, I'm going to take a trip and, and, and see if I can meet other people like myself. And, and it, there's a, it, there's a, there's a great sense of it, of putting ourselves on the line, but it also, it's the only thing that, broadens you up again art and magic and this type of spirituality they open you up again to wonder even as they make you vulnerable mm -hmm. uh and when you were answering that you said things like you know look knowing halloween was coming things like that um it, it, where it, some place that you've lived any place that you've lived um and you don't have to tell people where you live necessarily don't think that i'm asking that um is there some bit of local folklore or like a local legend or legendary figure um, that, as you say, has an eye to the strange <laughs> that that would capture someone's imagination? That's a good that's a good question. You mean like a, a local legend sort of thing or something like that? Sure. Right? Yeah. Like it's, every place has their own local folklore and their own. Like not just the the common history, who started the town, who did this, who did that, you know the the more uncommon things the the that seem to attract people the the story that kids tell each other, you know, right, that kind of right, stuff. right, right. You know, I uh, my friend Zem is the best resource I know for local ghost stories, legends, and hauntings and things like that. He's got dozens of them, so I usually rely on him. I will say that I do I do live in the part of the country that's considered the land of Lincoln, right? Same. <laughs> and, and, and Lincoln himself, you know, had a, had a tragic life with his, you know, he had children who died young and he himself had a, a you know, precognition of his death, of his own death. And sure enough, you know, he, he did die violently. And, um, and actually, you know, I don't know if people know this, but, you know, he died in Ford's theater when he was shot and Ford's theater in Washington, DC still has an exhibit uh, and if you go to see the exhibit, you can see the dress that was worn by the actress who was down below his stall because he was shot from behind by John Wilkes Booth. And he was watching 
uh, the play Our American Cousin. And the actress down below him was spattered with his blood when he was shot. And they still have the dress. And not only do they have the dress, but they have the door that um, that was between him and the hallway. And they have the piece of wood that was jammed in the door by John Wilkes to leave it jammed open so he could approach un- unseen because the, uh, the Secret Service did such a lousy job protecting Lincoln. They were watching the play too. And, um, and so I will say that, you know, Lincoln is one of the, the nation's best ghost stories. And, and he is, you know, his, his story is centered here where I live in this part of the country. But his killing took place in D.C. But I've been you know, privileged enough to see that bloody dress. And it's covered. It's a sort of a tannish brown dress, but it's covered in these rust colored stains. It's not a small spattering. It's covered in blood. And oh, you wow. think she was standing, you know, 20 feet away from him. And this idea of uh, that that's the blood of Lincoln on this dress, you know, and she later she went ran upstairs and she cradled him um, with his head in her lap while they ran to get a doctor. So part of the blood on the dress is him, her holding him while he died. And uh, and it's an incredible idea. Do you look at that dress and so much of what seems like just sort of a story of our nation's history? All of a sudden mm-hmm. it becomes frighteningly real when you realize that's his blood you know yeah and so it's uh that i always think of that when when i get tired of looking at all the lincoln t-shirts and top hats on 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 you know on you know restaurant decor and things like that i think now that the guy was real and there was a and he had a sense of his own death that came to him in dreams and he watched his own uh you know one of his sons die young that guy knew tragedy and he knew haunting and um and he haunted to a degree, you know, his his widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, felt haunted by him. And, and there were spirit photographs. Some say she was taken advantage of by spiritualists in photographs because she was so eager to think that he was alive. You know, there would be, you know, there were, there were photographs people developed to show his ghost standing over her shoulder and that sort of thing. So there was a legacy of hauntings related to Lincoln. So I have to throw that out if I had to come up with a, yeah. <laughs> a, uh, yeah. a celebrity haunting in our area. There you go. Yeah. Hey, I, I tell people anytime you come here, there's a sign for everything Lincoln. Lincoln stayed here for a night. Lincoln ate here. Once. Lincoln <laughs> slept right. here. Lincoln pooped here. Yeah, you know, right. like, <laughs> <laughs> there's no true. shortage of anything Lincoln did around here. Um, yeah. What a peculiar time that would have been too. Just think about the like the the wave of spiritualism, the way it took hold of right. the public after imagination. After, yeah, after the Civil War. In, right. in the Civil War, the tragedy that it just the death that it rained down on this country. It's it's almost surprising to me. There just must not have been access to the proper texts yet for spirits like Hecate and Odin or other liminal spirits to become more prevalent and known at that time. No, no, it was just so such a monolithically Christian culture, you know, that everything was seen through the lens of 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 Christianity, and that. Uh, but it was, but you know, their need to touch to communicate with spirits was no, you know, less real for that, and and talk about you know over six hundred thousand dead, and and the so many of them young. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's in, it's it's unthinkable how many people died in that conflict. And to think of the scope of the the loss and that yearning to contact someone who had gone, I mean, what a what a deep and what a powerful experience for those who had it to be able to think that they actually communicated with someone who could hear the dead or see the dead. You know? Yeah. So I had um, two listener questions that I wanted to throw in here before we wrap up the regular oh, sure. portion. Uh, two of my favorite. There was a lot of common, and I just kind of boil them down to a couple. One is, and they wish to remain unnamed, um, one is about Crossroads. And kind of the idea I was getting from the questions coming in about Crossroads is, let me see if I can sum this up for you, is every intersection in town a Crossroads? (laughs) (laughs) I think that's kind of the gist we're getting at. (laughs) Right, right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll say this. The idea, you know, I think questions like this sort of presuppose there's a binary yes or no question, you know, 
a lot of us, we sort of have this, it's very Western and it's very American to think there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. You know, (laughs) tell me which are the right crossroads and which are the wrong ones. But the fact is when it comes to spiritual praxis, there's always a continuum. There's always more optimal choice and there's always a suboptimal choice. And you got a, a continuum, you know. I mean, the reason Ekate was associated, she was associated not with inside and outside, but the threshold of a building, because that's the liminal space in a building. She was associated not with inside the city or outside the city, but the gate of a city, because that's the liminal threshold of a city. She wasn't associated with roads to the east or roads to the west. She was associated with the crossroads, because that's a liminal space where one road splits into two or two roads cross, right? It's liminal. If you stand right at the center, which road are you on? Well, you're not on any of them because you're on all of them. You're not really on the road. You're at the crossroads where they cross. It's liminal, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, her, her her time, the new moon, it's not really a moon phase. It's the time between moon phases. There, there's this there's this liminality that she occupies the in-between, you know? So if we look at that, if that's her MO, what we know is that spaces are more Hakatian the more liminal or in between they are, and they're less Hakatian, the less liminal and in between they are. So if you think about it, it doesn't really matter. If you're in a city, every block, there's a four way grid often where two streets cross each other. And if you stand at the center of it, which street are you on? Well, you're on two streets at the same time, aren't you? Right? It's liminal because that's where the roads cross. And the same thing if you're on a a narrow path leading through the woods and it forks. If you stand at the fork, which road are you on? It's neither. Liminal. One of them feels more spookyish and Halloweeny and Hakatian, <laughs> but that's just because it's you know visually more you know it, it feels more traditionally gothic and spooky and and beautiful. But there's literally no reason that every single intersection in a city is not you know just as liminal as a path in the woods that forks. Now you could say, well, a a path that forks, that's three paths in one. And there is an association of triplicity with Hakate. Mm. And there's some truth to that. So maybe, but there's also some roads that split as well in the middle of a city into two paths. So that would be the same principle would apply to that. I tend to say, and for people that can't say they can't go out in the middle of a busy road. They live downtown in Chicago. They can't walk in the middle of it to leave a a plate of food without getting run over or arrested, right? Well, what's the liminal space in their condo? It'd be the the hallway, perhaps, between two rooms, or the threshold between this room and that room, or the windowsill that's between the inside and the outside. There's this, and sometimes there's certain rooms that feel liminal, too, because they don't seem to have a purpose or they, they're connective between other stuff. So what I would say to people is not to obsess over, is my crossroads good enough? But if you're calling a power of liminality or trying to leave an offering where a spirit of liminality would presumably be, consider, look for the most liminal space you can find. And if it's a busy intersection at a city, then that's what it is. Or if it's kind of a patch of land where the park ends and the city begins that's neither park nor city, well, then that's liminal too. Or if it's the little you know strip of earth surrounded by a curb that's in the middle of the highway and the avenue, it's not the road, but it's not off the road. It's just the divider. Well, then that's liminal as well. It's the liminality that's key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say too, I mean, for people who listen, they've probably heard me say this before. If you're new, you may not have, but a central part of my own practice is that you and I are crossroads. I stand at my Mm. altar every day before I do every single day. I stand at my altar and I I do the following. I stand at the crossroads, draw an equal R and cross on myself and then say, and I am that. And then I have a litany that I do after that. But Mm. after I get done with the litany, I come back and I say, and I stand at the crossroads and I am that, you know, and, that is a central concept to me as a magical practitioner that I am a crossroads. I am in essence, an avatar of what people think of when they think of crossroads. I think that's brilliant. And it also points out the fact that humans are liminal creatures too. We're creatures of flesh and spirit. We're where they overlap. So that makes us hybrids like chimeras, right? We're, we're a liminal creation. Also age wise, we're constantly aging 
what age are you really? Every second you think of it, you're one second older than you were before. <laughs> there's a there's a liminality to us spiritually, sexually. You know, there's a liminality to us. We're creatures of, you know, we have a, a mental intellectual life, but we also got an instinctive, intuitive life that intervened. Our conscious, our subconscious, and what's between. We have all these opposing forces inter, you know, interweaving and overlapping, and we're at the heart of those, and we're constantly mm-hmm. shifting our mentality, our, you know, what, what we think, what we feel, our age, our desires, our sense of faith, sense of awareness, all that. It's, we're not a stable thing. We're not a unified monolithic one thing, like a piece of wood. We're degenerating, but we're growing at the same time. We are liminal. I think that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I can't take full credit for that one by any stretch. I got, it, it was an idea I was piecing together for a long time and coming to it. And Aiden Walker, is the one that like really put it all together in a way that made me go, that's the missing piece that I I needed. So yeah, I agree. It, it was really brilliant. I told Aiden as much and I stole what I needed from him and told him. I was doing <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, next question uh, from listeners comes from Courtney and Courtney asks, what is the biggest misconception people have about the PGM? I think there's three misconceptions people make kind of equally. One um, is that it's too hard. The stuff in it is too hard or too complicated to do. And the fact is that there's many spells in it, but all they need is your voice. You know, it's just reciting a spell or writing down a few sentences. It's full of spells that are doable that don't require um, you know, amazing magical instruments or weird ingredients or things like that. But because they're not written down in any particular order, and because the way they are in the book, they start out with some of the most difficult spells. A lot of people give up early on thinking, I can't make hide nor tail of this. Like this thing is com- complicated as hell. I'll never be, I'm not going to do any of this stuff. One of the early spells talks about drowning a cat and people are like, I'm not going to drown a cat. And, and they just <laughs> oh. get turned off. <clears throat> yeah, and that's one of the reasons not to you know not to hype my own class, but when when I I teach a class on the PGM a year long class, and what we do is we look through I curated the simplest spells you know to show people there's a, you can be a sorcerer of the PGM with very little prep or expenditure of money and just you know the investments in your your effort and your will and your uh, you know and and your time and all that, but anyone can do it. It requires going through it and just finding you know, some of the simpler working. So it's it's not as complicated as it seems. That's the first misconception, that it's all unworkable and that it's so full of missing stuff and weird ingredients and secret codes that no one can figure it out. It's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> the second one is that it's Greek. And that's an understandable mistake. It's called the Greek Magical Papyria, the PGM, right? Mm-hmm. But in reality, they call it that because it's written in Greek. It's written in Coptic. But... The fact is, they come from the, all the spells in it were written by Africans for Africans, directed toward African targets. The spells come from Thebes, which is now called the city of Luxor, which is hundreds of miles south of Mediterranean in southern Egypt, not far from what was then called Nubia. So this was developed by Egyptian slash African sorcerers, and a lot of the magic conjures Egyptian gods, but because for hundreds of years, um, Egypt had been under Hellenic rule. They also referred to Hellenic gods like Hecate, you know. And it's also, when they were written, they were under Roman rule. So it will refer to some gods like Serapis, uh, who were, you know, Roman and, uh, you know, uh, conflations of gods. And also it refers to, there was a, a huge Jewish population in Egypt at the time. So it conjures angels and it conjures uh, Yahweh, and it conjures the Gnostic, there were Gnostic communities there. So it conjures Gnostic powers like Yahuwah and Abrasax. And so um, that's the second mistake, that it's all a Greek thing. It's really not Greek at all. It's African, it's Egyptian, but it's from Egypt when Egypt was a synthesis of African and European, of Hellenic and Roman, of Jewish and non-Jewish um, peoples. So it's, it's uh, syncretic the magic, which is really cool because we're a syncretic people too. If you're an American or if, you know, from Western Europe, we, our cultures are blend of lots of different influences. So yeah. that's one of the things that makes it approachable. 
the other mistake people make is that it um they think it comes from a time when magic was accepted and embraced and widely you know revered and that's a bunch of nonsense too in 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 Rome and Egypt you get burned alive if you paid someone to do sorcery for you and uh you'd be crucified if you were the one to um to do the working it was illegal to do so these spells in the PGM were written uh, they're outlaw magic written by outlaws for outlaw people it's probably priests or lectors working in their spare time to make money and help people that were in a lot of trouble the spells are for people that are being hunted down that are being indicted that are slaves with cruel masters that have lost out in love that are sick and dying people that are on the lam people that <clears throat> are broke people whose business is going, you know, (laughs) each of the spells, they're for people who are in trouble. They're for people with very little resources and and very little hope who are desperately reaching out to, uh, you know, uh, someone to say, listen, I know we could get in trouble for doing this. I'm going to pay you. I need a spell. I need, I need a spell to help me because something terrible is about to happen to me. Death, torture, imprisonment, bankruptcy, heartbreak, disease, these people are trying to ward it off with the last level of protection they know, which is street sorcery. So it's a, it's like the, the book is a collection of illegal spells performed uh, under really dangerous conditions by people who risked death by procuring and performing it. And, um, oh, I'll add, I'll add one more. People think it's a grimoire. <clears throat> You know, like a grimoire is mm-hmm. a well-structured book that's written for the public, you know, for people to say, here's from soup to nuts, how you, you know, with <laughs> yeah. lots of explanations and diagrams, stuff like that. But it's not. The PGM is just a massive magical spells that were written, not for public consumption, but apparently by a working sorcerer for his adept or her adept. And and so that they're they're not in any particular order. And some of them will include notes on how to do them. And some don't. And some include detailed instructions and some don't. And some are duplicative and some occur only once. And some call on Egyptian gods and some don't. And and they're all over the map. But that's what's exciting. It's like discovering someone's suitcase full of all the workings they ever did in their whole life. And you just get to rummage through it and be like, oh, my God, look at this. Holy hell. Can you believe this one? What the heck is this? You know, oh, this one reminds me of that that earlier one. Oh, this one I can't even read, you know. It's cool because it's not an organized thing. It's a cache of of someone's secret stash of spells. And that makes it really, really fun to look at. So I'll take them all together. It's disorganized, but it's doable. It's multicultural. It's transgressive. It's outlaw magic. And by all by all the comments that are inserted into it, it works, which is the yeah. most exciting part, you know. It actually works. And um, and when we do the class, and even for people who don't do the class, people are always startled by the results they get when they use these workings, because though they're very old, they tap into, I think, this eternal, as you put it, current of magic. And you don't have to believe in Typhon Set. You don't have to have, you know, a faith life in, you know, in Anubis or, or Hecate to do these spells. You simply do the praxis, you know. You say the words, you make the offerings, you pick the right night, you know, you summon up the, and it helps if you're initiated into a tradition where you can say with confidence, this will be because I'm the sorcerer. Like you said, I am the God, the demiurge of this working. I create reality. And just like you, you put it in that mantra you say every day, Egyptian priests would call themselves, they would say, I am Heka, which means I am the firstborn of the gods who calls forth all that is. They would step into the shoes of the demiurge. They would wear him like a mask, this craftsman of the world. And when they stepped into his place, they could create as a demiurge creates because they were essentially taking on his role. And so therefore, just as he created the world around us, they can create their own reality through the recitation of magic words and special conjurations and secret formulas, chanting vowels, calling upon spirit allies to make the magic happen. So it's exciting and it's transformative and it's performative and it's also leaves a lot of leeway for creativity on the worker's part, because to a large degree, you can shape the working, both its intent and its effect. So it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool. 
that's five stars dear yelp <laughs> it's cool it's cool <laughs> four stars didn't want to drown a cat <laughs> no, okay. four. um the the coolest thing about the pgm especially the way you just describe it is i and i i don't want it to get lost in the shuffle this idea that captures me is it's illegal the the practitioner of this magic can be killed for working this magic yet they're helping desperate people right which means they've got to get results right because if they don't get results then a runaway person gets caught by the authorities and says wait 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 right jack just tried to do, do this thing and maybe you want to get him instead i'll show you where he lives just let me go yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Exactly right. This yeah, is, it's so, not a hobby. It's not hobby magic. Yeah, um, this this. I mean, just look at your bookshelf, folks, and look at the the books on witchcraft and magic and whatever you might have, and try to wrap your head around the concept that you could be executed for right. even having them. I mean, just try to imagine how scary that would be. Yeah, and and. And then go about enjoying the freedoms we have today. Yeah, that's, so. <laughs> the, truth. that's the truth, man. Yeah. Okay, so that little dire message brought to you by the sponsors of... No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is a good spot to end the regular portion of the show. Um, is there anything that I should have asked, something you want to talk about that I didn't cover? You know, I'll just say this. The biggest problem I see when I deal with students and take them to my classes is oftentimes they don't trust themselves enough. Everyone has within them the ability to engage in uh, an awesome spiritual practice, whether it's contacting ghosts, connecting with the dead, divination, devotional work, sorcery, planetary work, whatever, whatever appeals to them. They all have the tools. To some degree, they've been trained not to trust themselves. They've been taught not to trust their own instincts, to follow someone else's instincts, to do what other people say. And so a large part of this process, I'm sure you know this too, when it comes to spirit explorations and visions, is to trust your gut and to listen to that quiet voice inside of you that says this, not that, you know? And if you do that, everything follows from that. And that's something we can do every day, is just try to listen to ourselves more than we do and not get so caught up in great teachers or this person said that or that book said this. Everyone's got good. Some people, a lot of people have great insights, but it all comes down to developing that gut instinct, this, not that, and mm -hmm. listening to that quiet voice inside and everything flows from that. So I just, <clears throat> you know, that's the only thing I'll say is just to encourage we all need to listen to our own instincts, our own intuition more and trust that we know what we're doing. Agreed. Very good advice. So. Where can people find you? Oh, well, I have a, <laughs> I have a website called jackgrail.com. And I also teach classes at the Blackthorn School, if you Google that. And I, uh, I teach uh, I, on my own uh, a different platform. I teach a class on, on uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and esoteric takeaways from the Homeric stories. And, um, and I'm also got a, I, I've got a class coming out that'll be on uh, the topic of the, the, the poet, uh, Robert and goddess worshiper Robert Graves, but I'll save that story for another later date. So yeah, yeah. that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I will make sure that all those get into the show notes as well. That way, people don't oh, have to thank go you. googling. I appreciate that, Lonnie. Yeah, not a problem. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to be here, Jack. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for letting me be on the show. It's wonderful. Awesome. Um, for everybody listening, whether you know the drill or not. We are about to take the rest of this conversation over to Patreon. If you want to hear the rest of this, you're going to have to go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com to click join the membership. Meanwhile, my friends, stay weird out there. <laughs> and it's bonus audio time. Jack Grail, are you ready? Absolutely, man. All right. First question in Patreon for your first visit to the show. That insinuates there will be more. <laughs> <laughs> is what famous person's resting place do you most want to visit? Famous famous place do, do I want to visit, did you say? Most famous person's resting place you want to visit. Oh, oh, oh. <clears throat> He's got a dog in his face right now, folks. Yeah, right. A black you know, one, even. <laughs> distracted by a black dog. He's just a very small one. You know, that's a great question. 
you want to hear how they just answered that question. What famous person's resting place would you most like to visit? That and many others, including what they think about the afterlife, what they may or may not do in cemeteries, what are their traditions, magical practices that have to do with the dead, folklore that surrounds their homes, and so much more. Available for only $5. $5 a month. Even if I make more than one episode in a month, it's still just $5 a month at patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or go to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership. You can find me on Instagram at weirdwebradio. You can find me on Facebook as Weird Web Radio or come join the new fun and exciting Weird Web Radio Facebook group. Thank you again for being here. Stay weird out there, my friends. Thank you.